And we're going to start off with what at first sight seems to be a relatively straightforward malformation, so-called atrial septal defects. But if we are fully to understand holes between the atrial chambers, the first thing we have to do is to distinguish, as I put in my first bullet point, a fold from a septum. Because once we have done that, we're then able to distinguish true holes within septal structures as opposed to holes that permit communications between the atrial chambers but which are not within the confines of the normal septum. And to me, this is the key to understanding so-called atrial septal defects, which, as you see, becomes a misnomer. Because hole, if holes exist between the atrial chambers that are not within the atrial septum, then, strictly speaking, they're not septal defects, and yet they are still interatrial communications. And we'll try to explain to you what we mean by that apparent paradox. And it is the difference between holes that exist within the oval fossa and those who worry about Englishing of these terms argue that we should be talking about the oval pit. And indeed there's a degree of truth in that, but we have incorporated fossa in its own form into the English language. But when we look at other defects, the so-called sinus venosus defect, the coronary sinus defect, and then the ostium primum defect, which we will relegate to discussion in our next session, what we're going to show you is that all of these holes are outside the confines of the normal septal structures. So what is a fold and what is a septum? Well, a fold, as the name suggests, is a bend in the outside wall of the heart. And certainly in postnatal life, these structures contain extra cardiac fat. And therefore, it should be relatively easy to recognize these not only in the autopsy specimen. And Andrew showed you yesterday exquisitely how you can see such folds in the autopsied heart. And he's going to show you that again. But it should also be possible to recognize such folds in the imaging techniques you all now have at your fingertips. So there is no reason at all why you should not distinguish folds, and they are clinically important, because if the surgeon goes into a fold, then he trespasses on the pericardial space. And similarly, in the inter if the interventional catheterizer pokes a catheter into a fold, the catheter also will go into the pericardial space. And there is then a fundamental difference because the surgeon, we hope, will notice and will spot that he has gone outside the confines of the heart and sew up the walls. The interventional catheterizer doesn't always have that opportunity. So it is important before undertaking these procedures to distinguish folds from septal structures. And there's no question that folds can interpose between adjacent chambers. And some would argue that in that respect they are septums in their own right. But in reality they are pseudoseptums because they incorporate part of the extra cardiac space. So we would like to define true septums as those walls which interpose between adjacent chambers. True septums, therefore, are exclusively within the confines of the heart. And if you remove a septum, and artificially you create a septal defect. And that is what nature does to create atrial septal defects. Since the holes within the heart obviously do not with the pericardial cavity. So let's draw you a cartoon of a four-chamber section, which hopefully is immediately obvious to all of you. So here is the right atrium, superior cable vein, right pulmonary veins, left pulmonary veins, the left. And you see that if artificially I take away the floor of the oval fossa, I stay within the heart and I create an atrial septal defect. 
And that is the essence of defects within the oval fossa. The communication created by removing the floor of the oval fossa permits us to stay within the confines of the heart. But I could also cut away the basal part of the so-called septum secundum. But as you see from my cartoon, the septum secundum in reality is the superior interatrial fold. It is a pseudoseptum rather than a true septum. And if I did cut away the base of that fold, not only would I create a communication between the right and left atrium, I would also create a communication with the extracardiac space and at the same time create the potential for tamponade. And that is the difference between folds and septal structures. When you go into a fold, you create a communication with the extracardiac space, as you would here if you went into the atrioventricular muscular sandwich, the area we'll discuss very shortly when we get atrioventricular septal defects. So that distinction between folds and septal structures permits us to distinguish true defects between the chambers, the probe patency of the oval foramen, and those defects within the oval fossa that are typically called secundum defects, but which exist because of deficiencies of the floor of the oval fossa, which is the primary atrial septum, and then there's other holes between the chambers which we believe are better called interatrial communications. And they are the sinus venosus defect, coronary sinus defect, and we will show you the phenotypes of these two entities very shortly. And then the osteum primum defect, which hopefully you are all aware is really an atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction but with separate valvar orifices for the right and the left ventricles. So let's start by looking at the simplest form of deficiency within the oval fossa, and that is probe patency of the oval foramen. This itself has become quite important recently because it's been suggested that such patency can underscore migraine. The essence of the probe patent oval foramen is that the flap valve, the primary septum, overlaps the infolded rims of the fossa. And significantly, such probe patency is present in one third of the normal population. Obviously, it is not of significance. Whilst left atrial pressure exceeds right atrial pressure, but it can become significant in abnormal hemodynamic circumstances. And we need to distinguish that from true defects within the oval fossa, which are produced either by fenestration of the flap valve or deficiency of the flap valve. So here is probe patency of the oval foramen. And as Andrew has pointed out, it is much better to see this in the moving specimen but in, than in the still specimen, but Andrew will show you very shortly how if you introduce a probe from the inferior cable vein and you place it, as I have done in the picture, between the floor of the oval fossa and the rims in one third of the population, that probe can be passed into the cavity of the left atrium because there is no mechanical or no anatomic union between the flap valve and the rims of the foramen, the rims of the fossa, which you see from the left ventricular side. So here you see the so-called horns of the flap valve, and the probe is passed between the rim and the floor of the oval foramen. Now many people in the migraine literature and in the adult literature talk about different sizes of the probe patent oval foramen. To me, that is a little artificial because the oval foramen is simply a closed door. And as long as the flap valve overlaps the foramen and left atrial pressure is higher than right, the door will remain closed. So if anything, we should be talking about the length of the space between the edge 
of the flap valve and the enfolded rim rather than trying to give size to this entity which only exists when you pass a probe through it. But Andrew will talk to you shortly. The true defects within the oval, for, oval fossa itself are very easy to understand. Here you see a picture showing multiple fenestrations in the flap valve and irrespective of the differential pressures between the chambers, that is always going to create a atrial communication. And here the floor of the foramen is deficient, the flap valve itself. To emphasize again, it is the primary septum that is deficient. The so-called secondary septum, seen here, the rim of the oval foramen, is no more than an infolding between the superior cable vein pulmonary veins. Now, much more interesting are these other defects which are outside the confines of the oval fossa. And the essence of the, these defects, both the sinus venosus and the coronary sinus defect, is that they cannot exist in the normal heart. So something has happened during development that has distorted the entirety of atrial septal formation. So the essence of the sinus venosus defect is that the oval fossa itself either has to be intact or deficient, but the rims of the oval fossa have to be formed, and then the phenotypic feature is overriding of a cable vein associated with anomalous connection of the right pulmonary veins. And indeed, I think Andrew will show you specimens to show that it is the anomalous connection of the right pulmonary veins that are the real key. Usually they involve the superior cable vein, but they can also involve the inferior cable vein. And here is one of the raw Brompton specimens, an exquisite specimen. This is an adult. You're looking down on the right atrium from above. So this is the mouth of the superior cable vein. You can see that it's overriding. There are the anomalous right pulmonary veins. And we have the oval fossa is intact. And we've passed this probe from front to back through the superior rim of the fossa, which rather now being a fold, has become a tube of myocardium containing the core. And when you look at it from the other side, you see that although the probe passes from front to back of the heart, you cannot see any of the probe here in the superior rim of the fossa. So the essence of the malformation is integrity of the oval fossa with overriding of the superior cable vein. Similarly with the coronary sinus defects. These cannot exist in the normal heart. You've already seen a coronary sinus defect because usually these are associated with persistent patency of the left superior cable vein and there is then a spectrum from the fenestrations we showed you yesterday to complete unroofing. Initially, we thought there was a common wall between the cable vein and the left atrium. We now know that each structure has its own walls, so two walls have to disappear, so as these lesions. We don't know how it happens, but this is the end result, seen from the right atrium, the heart that Andrew has already shown you, with juxtaposition of the right atrial appendage, again an intact oval fossa, and the mouth of the coronary functions as an interatrial communication because when you see it from the left side, again you note that the oval fossa is intact. Between the mouth of the persistently patent left superior cable vein, which is attached to the atrial roof, and the mouth of the coronary sinus, the walls have disappeared so that the sinus now functions as an interatrial communication. And then the osteum primum defect, which we will discuss later. The essential phenotypic feature of this lesion is the common atrioventricular junction. An atrioventricular septal defect with shunting exclusively at atrial level, albeit that much of the shunting is below the level of the atrioventricular junction. The key here is that again in this lesion, the atrial septum can be well formed, the oval fossa can be intact, and this lesion is an atrioventricular septal defect 